Welcome everybody to the Scale Up Show. This is your host, Ryan Staley, and I have a very special guest with me today. I have Jason Chicola. Jason is the CEO and founder of Rev.com, is doing some amazing things in the voice AI, voice platform space, specifically as it relates to AI. Jason, welcome. Happy to have you back for part two of the show. Thanks for being on, man. Thanks, Ryan. Glad to be back. Yes. Um, so if you do not listen to episode one, go back and check that out. One of the really cool things that Jason talks about was the evolution of voice AI, where it's heading, not just today and, and what you can take advantage of, but in the future. And this is very timely because as of recording, advanced voice mode was being rolled out for, uh, or I should say from open AI. So we talk about the nuances on why you'd want a voice platform versus more of a general LLM solution. So it's really great insight. So go back and check that out. It's foundational. So this episode though, we're gonna shift gears a little bit and we're gonna really focus on AI memory and how to look at this holistically across, um, not just you as a person and what you're doing, but organizationally. So Jason, like, why don't you walk us through like your whole concept and point of view as it relates to AI memory? Cause a lot of people are missing the boat on this. And so I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Um, sure. You know, let me start from a common experience that most of your audience probably feels. Um, in 2020, the world changed in a bunch of ways. And the big change in the workplace is we went from, you know, driving to an office and sitting next to people and having coffee with them and chatting to being behind these, 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 uh, you know, screens a lot in Zoom meetings. And that had profound changes in the way that we work. It led to most people having many more meetings than ever before. It led to them being, being drained and not energized. So you had, for the, on the one hand, you get more interaction, which in theory, you should be getting more done. But people felt worse about it and they're just, their heads all over the place. And people would be saying like, not only is it exhausting, but I don't even know what we're accomplishing in all these meetings. And, and so I think that there's something wrong with the way we're working today. And I think we have the opportunity to kind of take back control. Like there's no rule that says you have to be in seven Zoom meetings a day. So, so why would you do it? And I think that AI can be our, can be our friend here. So the, the concept, I mean, well, well, let me just say that, you know, before digital memory, so what's your memory? The memory is the things you've encountered in your life that you can recall when you need to, right? Mm -hmm. And um, we all have different memories. We all remember different things. I, some things I remember, some things I, I forget, right? Um, but you know, we all want to want to to feel sharper and be able to recall important information about a client or a boss or a colleague at the right time. And so, you know, I think on layer one, digital memory is the idea that I shouldn't have to forget things if a computer can save it for me. Just like, you know, if I have to multiply really large numbers, a calculator can do that faster than I can. Mm -hmm. If I want to recall something that I heard in a meeting. A computer can do that better than I could, right? That, that right. that's the that's the basic level, but it goes much deeper than that because, um, you know, a digital memory can not just remember what what you what you heard, but it can it can remember things that you missed. It can remember meetings that you weren't in. So, you know, if you're, for example, a sales leader, and you're working with with you know clients A, B, and C, you can ask your digital memory to check the digital memories of your peers. To see what are all the things that my clients at Procter and Gamble or IBM or or, or, or Pepsi mm -hmm. have told me about what they need in my product and what I should tell them when, when I see them next. So uh, I believe we're at this moment in time where um, people are going to get the superhuman power to not just remember all the things that matter to them, but to be able to access the information that that matters, um, information that matters that others might have captured, information that your that your company has. You know, maybe it's information, you know, online. And if I, let me kind of bridge this to, to the LM topic. You know, those who spend time with LMs geeking out on it have heard of this concept of a context window, right? When I ask a prompt, am I asking one question? How much does it know about me? LLMs out of the box don't know who you are until you tell it, but they know what the world knows. So LLM is a great place to go to find out, like, where's the best barbecue in Austin? You get some pretty interesting answers that, that are probably informed because that's a common question. but you know, if, if Jason or Ryan wants to know what are my top three customers, what do they need most, and what should I go offer them to help grow their business, right? ChatGPT doesn't know that. It can't know that. It, it couldn't know that. And so, um, to, to get the most out of these tools, you don't want a generic answer like where to get barbecue or pizza. You want a specific answer for like the problems in my life. And I think the only way to do that is to start to collect 
what I would call a digital memory, which mm -hmm. I would start with capturing my most important um, voice recordings. I would note of things that I don't think are, are too confidential or sensitive. I, I wouldn't put one-on-ones from an HR perspective in there, but but I would put important customer conversations, things that you think are, you know, reasonable to share with with colleagues and coworkers and clients. And if you capture your memory, if you capture calls, meetings, interviews, work, now for the first time, you can connect dots in a way that wasn't possible in the past. And you could then go and say, hey, what are my clients happy about? What are my clients annoyed about? And what should I go do to solve their issues? And, and, I, and I think that LMs are going to become much more powerful and much more used as people start to collect and amass digital memory. Um, I'm dating myself here, but I'll give you a little bit of a metaphor. Did you ever use uh, Evernote? A little bit, yeah. I, I used it a little bit, yeah. So it was a, like a cold classic product, you know, a little bit more than a decade ago. Yeah. I was really into it for a while. And, you know, Evernote was this note-taking tool that um, their logo was a, was a green elephant. And the reason why they chose an elephant for their logo is because supposedly elephants have great memory. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. My right? mom used to say that. She's like, yeah, you're like an elephant. You never forget or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, it, that's it, a lifestyle, right? Yeah. It, exactly. But, but the, it, and with Evernote, the first day you used it, it wasn't that great. But the more you put into it, you know, the more powerful it became. And so, um, you know, what, what's your trusted place to go look for information? Most people don't really have one because now that we're living in these sort of hybrid worlds where there's all this virtual communication, people typically have conversations and communication all over the place. Mm -hmm. I record memos on the phone. I have meetings here. There's videos that we posted on YouTube. There's support calls that are over here and sales calls over there. Our belief is if you start to consolidate that voice data, you can connect dots and find patterns. And that's where the magic really happens. Okay. Yeah. I, Huge believer in it, and I've seen that firsthand just with um, identifying language patterns, trends, objections within sales transcripts that, that I've done personally and for clients too. So like, I guess for you, man, like I, I know you work across a wide range of industries. Like what are your top three like measurable outcomes you've, you've gotten from, and let's, let's keep it on the business side, right? Um, from digital memory for clients. Like, give us some examples. I know you gave some examples already, but let's go a little deeper on the example. Let's double click on that, right? So like, what are three of some of your favorites that you've ever seen? And then what's the business result? That's great. Sure, I'll give you an example for a, um, you know, for, for a journalist. I mean, we, we built our, our platform in concert with some of the world's largest um, media companies and the people that write the news. And if you think about the process of writing the news, a journalist today, has to write so many articles in so little time. And if they make one mistake, people, you know, criticize yeah, them, right? So they, they, they want to write great articles that are insightful, that are punchy, that, that pull out, you know, the human spirit, you know, really good human narratives um, with no mistakes. And so they typically, if they're writing an article, they'll typically interview three to five people for that article. And um, I would say that the, the, the value that we, you know, used to provide or, or the initial value was, we're going to give you the most accurate, near perfect transcript of that, of that interview, because that's going to help you um, do a great job. And a lot of the tool tools out there deliver a lot of mistakes and errors in the transcript, and and you don't want to misquote somebody. So getting the accuracy of what that celebrity, you know, whether it's a athlete or or a politician, said is really vital. But now we go two steps beyond that. And when I'm writing an article about a, a basketball player, and I've interviewed six people, and I have 200 pages of transcripts. <laughs> How do I go from 200 pages of text to a 200 word story that's punchy and, and clever and good to read? So um, we save them time in that process so they can write a better story and not do the grunt work. So an example is, you know, we have several AI templates that are really custom prompts that are built for journalists that extract um, the, the most punchy quotes, extract themes, extract patterns across, the, across that, uh, that body of interviews. And what folks tell us is that if I had an intern, that's what they would be doing. So mm -hmm. the that article, instead of writing it, you know, in eight hours, now I can write it in, in in an hour, and the seven hours of collecting material, which is kind of the part I don't like to do. Now AI is doing that for me better than I could do it because it's more patient than I am. You know, I'm never going to read 200 pages of 200 pages of, of transcript looking for that one needle in the haystack, but AI will do it. You know, lickety split. Um, so what that means, you know, measurable outcome is uh, I can write that article in a third of the time. And mm -hmm. I'm going to feel better about it. So, so I think for the organization that, that's doing this, they're 
producing more and less time. Their people are um, feel better. Their, their people have you know higher sort of morale and spirits. When you take grunt work out of your job, that's going to lead over time to higher retention and satisfaction. Um, a good analogy I would put here to anchor on something your 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 audience may or may not have heard about is software engineers today are often using GitHub Copilot to help them write code. Mm-hmm. And when an engineer uses AI to help them write code, they get more done in less time and they feel better about it. They're, they're more fulfilled and they're less drained. Um, so that, that, that's, that's the pattern that, that we see and we want people to experience where I get, more, I get more, more work done, but more importantly, I have more fun in the process because I'm not doing the parts that I don't like, I'm doing the parts that I do like. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a good example for, for a journalist. You know, for me, uh, my favorite way to use the product uh, professionally is to analyze um, customer calls and demos and look for patterns and what customers are telling us, right? So it just, my ability to listen, like my memory has expanded a lot because now I can analyze a bunch of meetings that I wasn't in and figure out what are we hearing, what's resonating, what what could be better, what can we improve? And um, that's a that's a pretty good superpower that we're just starting to, to really hone in on. Yeah, I love that use case too. I think it's great. Uh, oh, all of them are great, actually. Like, and I think you know what I think a lot of folks miss when it comes to AI is like the emotional uplift users have when they discover something like that, right? Like, how cool is it like to not have to do seven hours of crap work that you either despise or it's like it's like the shit sandwich part of the job that you have to do, right? Like. Like, that's amazing. It's like, it's like if you're a sales rep too, and you didn't have to write RFPs, right? <laughs> or you could like, totally. you know, answer RFPs in 10 minutes as opposed to 10 hours, right? Like, it's the same kind of concept because those are like energy vampires and time piranhas for what you're doing, um, <laughs> which makes your life miserable in terms of that part of the job, right? So um, that's at least what I've seen when working with people. I'm sure you've seen the same thing with what you're talking about, but I think that's so understated, um, but super valuable. Would you agree with that? Hundred percent. I love the phrase "energy vampires." I haven't heard that. I'm hoping the mind is going to steal that. Oh, go ahead and reuse it. But, 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 I mean, the the, I think you said it right. Like on the surface, there's time savings, and that, that implies money because you can do other stuff. But the but the real value is getting rid of those energy vampires. You know, part of the way I, I like to talk about it is, you know, if you think about if you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs that says mm-hmm. we all need, you know, food, shelter, security, and, you know, as a baseline. And if we have all those things, we can we can pursue fulfillment and what what, what they call self actualization. You know, I, I would say think think of an think of a career where people enter with high hopes and leave unfulfilled, right? Doctors, many doctors leave the practice of medicine because of all the paperwork. They like the patients, but it's the billing that, that kills them. You know, mm-hmm. or maybe lawyers go in there because they they, they love arguing a case or they love the justice system, but the billable hours and and, and the minutia drags them down. And so I, I think the highest societal good and productivity that can come out of AI is using it to make jobs more enjoyable, help you do, help you do the things that you're good at. And let's let AI do the crappy parts of the job. Let's take all the grunt work of the job and have mm-hmm. AI do as much of that as possible. So you do the things that, that you know, that, that you uh, want to do in the first place. Like nobody goes into a doc, becomes a doctor because it's like, I'm really interested in medical billing. Right. So th- that, if, if you could solve medical billing with AI, which people are working on, right, you'd make doctors happier and you'd have fewer retire early. So true. All right. So we got time for one more question. This is this is top of mind. So you mentioned looking across like multiple modalities besides just voice with like it's in writing, it's over here, it's over there. Is there a way where you can centralize like not just voice, but also like emails and other components of data that you're looking at as well with this? Or how does that work? Um, you know, customers are asking us for that. So uh, not yet, but hopefully soon. We're getting that question a ton because you know, when um, when we've sat with CIOs and this product just launched and when we sit with CIOs and, and we're showing them the power, here's here's kind of the stages of reaction. It's almost like you know, we're getting them to that eureka moment. The first thing is like, oh, we're using ChatGPT and we like it. Okay, that's good. Um, but how are you doing it? Oh, we're pasting things in and we're prompting it. And it takes a long time. And, and then, they, then they realize that um, if you centralize the voice data and have multiple LMs, you can do a lot more. And then they're like, wait, well, actually we could get a unified view of the customer. If I want a unified view of the customer is unbelievably valuable, right? People think about that from a data perspective. We have systems that measure stuff, right? So companies today, CIOs, they can tell you a bunch of numbers about the customer, but they can't tell you what the customer's thinking, right? Mm -hmm. And and my my high-level thesis is that is there more value in my Snowflake repository as all my numbers, 
or in my conversations that have all these feelings and emotions and insights, I would say the latter. So if you think I want a unified view of my customer, if the CEO is going to go talk to the customer, he wants to know what's up before he walks in the room. How does he get it? Um, the only way to get it, and you kind of alluded to it, is to combine voice data with things like Slack and support and email so you know what my customer Pepsi is telling me because I want to go in there and be responsive, right? I mean, for a customer, it's pretty annoying when you talk to different people and they only have a, whole, a part of the story. It's like, you, you know, you're talking to different parts of the elephant and back to the elephant and the memory, right? A customer wants to talk, talk to you as, as an organization and you know what their needs are. So, um, you know, if, if there's clients of yours or, or audience members of yours that are interested in this, please talk to me. We would love to build out integrations to ingest other forms of customer communications because I think that getting a unified view of the customer for an organization, like what do you want in the memory of your company? Mm-hmm. It's you want to know what the customers care about, right? Yeah. And, and to get there, you got to combine, you got to start with voice data and then layer in the other stuff like text. Excellent, man. Well, um, do you have time for one more question or no? Are we up? I know we're Go just about it. up. Yeah, okay. let's, let's so do it. The one area that I didn't hit as you were talking uh, is like the emotional sentiment and emotional intelligence within there. And I know there's there's tools that are starting to come out that are trying to measure this. Do you have any element of that focus within what you're doing as well? Because that's something that's like super interesting just across a lot of areas. Um, so uh, yes, on a limited basis, based upon what we can, you know, do with all labs. And let me unpack, I think what's possible today, what's, what's possible maybe, you know, in the near future. Um, so you, we can certainly take voice calls and it can be customer calls and ask when when was the the tone these things can measure tone so mm-hmm. when was the tone of the prospect excited energized versus where was they apathetic or where were they frustrated right and if you're you know you have a big background as a go to market leader if you were looking at a thousand sales calls and you could isolate the highs and lows mm-hmm. when were my prospects the, the the happiest and when were they the most frustrated that becomes kind of your most important information Right, because you don't want the sea of not of nonsense. You want to know the highs and the lows so that you could ride your winners, cut your losses, fix the problems. Um, so, so the the value of extracting sentiment, I think, is a ten out of ten. Sentiment becomes how you find the needle in the haystack. What are the moments that matter? It's the highs and the lows that matter in our life. It's the highs and the moments. Mm-hmm. It's the highs and lows that we talk to you about our, our our spouse when you're home. Right, the best thing in your day, the most annoying thing in your day. Um, now, let me tell you, science fiction, what's possible, and I can't promise all these things today, but. I can promise you that, that we, we'd like to deliver these things. I believe there's three distinct ways to measure sentiment. And I think the current technologies probably do maybe only one of them well. Um, and, and as humans, we do all three. I can hear your voice. Mm-hmm. And from your voice, I can kind of infer from the tone of your voice, whether you're happy, sad, or angry. And if you spoke Spanish, or I speak Spanish, if you spoke Mandarin, which I don't speak, right? I could still tell if you were happy, sad, or angry from your voice because as humans, as humans, you know, we we do that naturally. Computers have to be taught. We do it out of the box. So voice is one. The second is the words themselves. If I tell you I'm angry about this or I love that feature, just from from, from the text, I can infer what, what the person means. Now, sarcasm can cut against that, right, to an extent, but for the most part, that's the second way. And the third way is body language. Right, facial expressions. You know, as you know, the best sellers in the world want to be in the room. The best sellers in the world, like the best poker players, read faces. Okay, and I don't think technology is there yet, but there is a science to it. You know, fun fact for your readers, or or rather your listeners, um, there's a guy named Paul Ekman, who who I think is like I think he's probably retired, probably deceased, but he's a world expert in reading faces for emotions. He wrote a book called Emotions Revealed. There was a Mm -hmm. TV show called Lie called Lie to Me with Tim Roth. That's based on 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 a in the show Tim Roth play, plays a detective. They could read faces. He can look at your face and tell if you're lying. And, and so, um, I know that this guy Paul Ekman trained FBI investigators to catch people in lies. So if Paul Ekman can do it, and his book his book I have, I have it at home, and like it shows you like which muscles are twitch when you're lying or whatever it is. So between if I can read your face, if I can read your voice, if I can read the words, I believe over time. AI is going to be pretty good at this stuff, right? And, and I think that's I think that's going to take it to the next level. Love that, man. Yeah, no, that's it's a great breakdown. So, um, and there's lots of I remember I so I used to be really deep into poker in the poker space. So there's a lot of like body language books that I read and whatnot for tells and 
So uh, I'll have to go check out Paul Ackman's book, though. That sounds good. So, Jason, we're up on time. Where can people find you? Where can they learn more about Rev.com? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Jason Chicola. You can find me on X at Jason Chicola, my full name spelled out. Or please come to Rev.com. You can try it. You can get a free account or a paid account. Um, and we'd love to hear what you think. Uh, email me, Jason, at rev.com. Love to hear, hear from your audience. Thank you so awesome, much. man. Part two was a blast. Part one was amazing too. So thanks for being on the show again, man. It was awesome. It was great meeting you here and what you're working on. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys are continuing to put out there. I'm, I'm definitely going to check it out myself. It's a pleasure, Ryan. Hope to see you when you make it to Austin. Maybe we can get some barbecue. Yeah, sounds like a plan. All right. And we will see you all on the next episode.